Welcome to video three for week five. So far I've defined the concept of a vector field, assigning a vector to each point in a region of Rn, and I've talked about integral curves as a way to understand the movement caused by a vector field, particularly if the vector field is a field of fluid flow or a field of force. Now I want to talk about derivatives of vector fields. Like scalar fields that we did in Calculus 3, there are new derivatives associated with the vector fields. There's not one single extension of the derivative. The derivative is more complicated than that, but it still has the basic idea of understanding how the vector field changes. So I want to understand, moving around the region in space, what the vector field is doing, how it's changing, how it's increasing, how it's decreasing, in what directions that's happening. And I have a couple of differential operators on vector fields that do that in a couple of different ways. All of these depend on the operator nabla, this upside down triangle. So let me remind you briefly what that is. I defined this in Calculus 3. We used it to define the gradient. Um, nabla is a vector of different partial differential operators. So in R2, it is the vector of the operator partial in x and the operator partial in y. In R3, we also have the operator partial in z. And then in Rn, I can have the operator of the partials in all n components. So in the first component, it takes the derivative in the first variable, so forth and so on. And this is going to be the notational tool that lets us define the two important derivatives of vector fields. So let me define them. This nabla is a vector, so I can use vector operations. So nabla cross f, this is a vector derivative defined only in R3. So if f is a vector field in R3, I can take the cross product of this vector back here of differential operators with the vector field f. And if I do that cross product, well, each multiplication in that cross product is going to be some operator times some component of the vector field. I do that, I'm going to get differences of partial derivatives in each component. It's going to look like this expression. This is called the curl of a vector field in R3. The curl of a vector field is going to represent the tendency of the vector field to cause local rotation. So let me sort of draw this in R2 even though it's going on in R3. I have some vector field in R2 with some vectors and there's some paths, some integral curves that go along this Curl's not referring to the bends globally in the integral curves. So it'd be tempting to say that curl is telling us how these paths are curving. It's not curvature. So the, the curving of these parametric curves, of these integral curves, would be described by the curvature of those parametric curves calculated as we did in Calculus 3. What the curl is doing is it's saying, well, if I have an object that's moving along this path, as it's moving, it might also start spinning around an axis. So you can have an object that is moving along here, but also spinning around some axis while it moves. Curl represents the tendency of the vector field to create the spinning motion of objects as they move along a, a path. And I could move along a straight path, but still be spinning locally around an axis, or it could be moving along a curved path and not spin at all. So this has nothing to do with the curvature of the path. It is a local spinning action while we're moving along a path. The second thing I want to define, I did the cross product. Well, I'm also going to do the dot product. So again, I have this differential operator and the dot product works in any dimension. So I can assume this works in any Rn. I can take the dot product of the differential operator nabla with a vector field f. Well, that's going to be the operator in the first variable acting on the first component, plus the operator in the second variable acting on the second component, all the way to the operator in the last variable acting on the last component. This is called the divergence of the vector field. This measures the tendency of the vector field to gather together or to dis disperse. So something that looks like this, where all the vectors are pointing together, is going to have a large positive divergence. And something that looks like this, where all the vectors are pointing away, is going to have a large negative divergence. Divergence is the tendency of a vector field to gather or disperse. This is interesting to think of for fluids. 
Some fluids do this and some fluids don't. If things are gathering together, then I expect pressure to be increasing here. If things are dispersing, I expect pressure to be decreasing here, um, or perhaps density, depending on how the fluid is operating. That can happen with gaseous fluids. I can have gaseous fluids where I sort of press them all together, or I sort of spread them all apart, and their density is going to change. That doesn't really happen I really should talk about density here, not pressure. That doesn't really happen with liquids, like water. The density of water is roughly the same. The pressure is going to increase because the, the pressure is the sort of force on an object in the water. But the, the actual number of water molecules in a certain region, under reasonable circumstances, doesn't really change. Water is sort of uniformly dense, um, no matter how it's flowing. So fluids, in that sense, can sort of be split into two categories, gaseous fluids that I where I allow for changes in density, and liquid fluids where I don't expect changes in density. These are called compressible and incompressible fluids, and a fluid is, is incompressible if its divergence is zero. So things like water, we expect them we have, if we have the flow of water, ocean currents, we expect it to be a flow that has zero divergence. Whereas if I have a situation where I have a gas and I can compress it or decompress it, then I expe expect a divergence that could possibly be non-zero. Again, that's called compressibility and incompressibility. I should have mentioned the curl as well. If something has curl zero, it is called irrotational in the same way that I have incompressible for zero divergence. I want to mention one more operator. I actually defined this in Calculus 3. This is the Laplacian of a scalar field, but now I can give it a slightly nicer definition. If I have a scalar field, its gradient is a vector field. It was the vector of partial derivatives, so that was one, it's going to be one of the more important examples of vector fields that are going to be the gradients of scalar fields. And then I can take the divergence of that gradient. So the divergence of the gradient is the thing that I'm going to call the Laplacian. I mentioned this before in Calculus 3, it's an important thing to understand vector fields. If a vector, or a scalar field, so if a scalar field has zero Laplacian, it's called a harmonic scalar field. In particular, this lets us extend a couple of important differential equations that I defined in Calculus 3. The heat equation and the wave equation. Each of these differential equations had a time derivative on the left and a space derivative on the right. Here it said that the diffusion of heat depends on the concavity of the heat distribution. Here it said the acceleration of a wave depends on the concavity of the current wave state. I can extend these to three dimensions. So these were one-dimensional situations. So this was a wave or a heat distribution on a wire or a string or a rod or some kind of one-dimensional object. But waves and heat distributions work in three dimensions as well. I can think of heat moving around in all three dimensions. I can think of three-dimensional wave distributions, say like a sound wave propagating through three dimensions. So I'd like to be able to write these equations in three dimensions. Well, this concavity turns into exactly a Laplacian, a three-dimensional Laplacian. So you want to think about Laplacian measures. It's sort of like a multi-dimensional concavity that measures the the nature of the distribution, the instability of the distribution, that's going to cause either diffusion of heat or acceleration and deceleration of the wave as it propagates through space. All right, I want to finish this video talking about operations uh, and how they interact with different... I want to talk about algebraic operations and how they interact with differential operations. And there's going to be three important categories. First, let me talk about linearity. All differential operators we expect to be linear. That is certainly true. So let me just review the linearity rules that I have so far. The gradient, just to review it from math, uh, from calculus three, is linear. So if I have scalar fields F and G, remember my convention is that lowercase things are scalar fields, multiplied by constants A and B and added together, then the gradient can be broken up by linearity as the gradient of the two things added together multiplied by constants. If I have two scalar fields, I can, or vector fields, I can multiply them by scalars A and B or constants, add them together or subtract them from each other, and then I could take a curl in R3, and then this curl would split up over linearity. It would be the curl of the two individual vector fields, then multiplied by the scalar, then added or subtracted from each other. Same thing for divergence. 
the divergence of a linear combination. I can take the divergence individually, then multiply by the scalars, then add them up. And the Laplacian also works the same way on scalar fields. If I have two scalar fields, multiply them by constants, add them up. I can do the Laplacians first, then multiply by the constants, then add them up. All things defined via derivatives, since they all go back to the partial derivative, which is linear, they're all going to be linear. Working with products is a little bit more interesting. So the Leibniz rule for single variable functions, the product rule, said that the derivative of a product was this combination where I take the derivative of one piece and multiply it by the other. Now we have a bunch of different differential operators and a bunch of different kinds of products. And it turns out basically for each differential operator and each kind of product, there is some version of the Leibniz rule. So let me go over three of these that will be useful to us. So in R3, I can take the cross product of two vector fields. I have two vectors in R3, I take the cross product. The output of a vector field is a vector. So at each point in the domain of F and G, assuming there is a shared domain, then I can take the cross product of the outputs and get a new vector field, which is the cross product of the original. Then I can take the divergence of that cross product. So now I have a differential operator and a product. And this turns out to be more or less what you expect, is I take the curl of one piece, multiply by the other, this multiplication now turns into the dot product. And then the first times the derivative of the other, this multiplication turns into the dot product. The only slight difference here is instead of adding them, I now subtract them. This is going to be generally true. The Leibniz rule we had in single variable calculus was always adding, but in general, the versions of the Leibniz rule that show up, they can be um, addition or subtraction depending on the situation. You can think of this subtraction here coming from the fact that the cross product is not commutative, it is, it is anti-commutative, which means if I interchange the order, I get a negative sign. So maybe that justifies that negative here. All right, if I have the scalar product, so if F is a scalar field and capital F is a vector field, then I can take the scalar product at each point. So at each point in the domain, I calculate the vector field, I calculate the scalar field, and I multiply the vector by the scalar. That's going to give me a new vector field, the scalar product uh, of the original vector field by the scalar field. I can take the divergence of this. And now I can also make a Leibniz rule for this. But these two things are different things. I have a scalar field and a vector field. So the Leibniz rule is going to look a little bit strange. In the first component, it's going to be the divergence of the scalar of the vector field. And then I'm going to multiply this by the scalar field. This is a scalar. So I'm going to multiply two scalars together. And then adding for the scalar field here, I can't take a divergence of it. I have to take the gradient of it. So these Leibniz rules get a little bit strange because if the pieces are not exactly the same, then I don't have the same derivatives, but it's still the same setup. I still have the first function, derivative of the second, and then derivative of the first and the second function. It's just the products and derivatives are going to be different depending on what kind of functions I'm doing. This product, for example, is a dot product. This is a vector field. This is a vector field. The dot product is a scalar field. This is a scalar. This is a scalar, the product of two scalars is a scalar. Add two scalars together, I get the scalar, which makes sense because the output of divergence is again a scalar. Lastly, I can take the curl of a scalar product of a vector field, and it's gonna be the same thing, derivative of the first times the curl of the field plus the gradient of the scalar field cross product with the other vector field. So again, the products sort of match. This is a cross product, this is a cross product, this is a cross product. But this is a curl and this is a gradient because those are the appropriate derivatives to take of the object in either the first or the second component. This is a little bit strange, but if you sort of get it around your head that these always have the same form, it's always one function times the derivative of the other, the derivative of the first times the derivative of the second, you just need to figure out what the right thing is to play, put in those places, what derivative, what product is the right thing that makes sense. Lastly, I want to mention two very interesting rules, and I'm going to talk about these near the end of the course again. Uh, I already talked about the Laplacian, which is the divergence of a gradient that gave me this Nabla squared thing. And this thing, if happened to be zero, that meant that f was harmonic. But most functions are not harmonic. This thing is often not zero. But two other consecutive differential operators are, in fact, always zero. The curl of a gradient is always zero. 
So you take the gradient of the scalar field, you're always going to get something irrotational. Remember that curl equals zero was called irrotational. And likewise, the divergence of a curl is also zero. So if you take the curl of a vector field, you're going to get something that's incompressible. Divergence equals zero means it's incompressible. And this is interesting that both of these combinations of different differential operators always give us zero. This eventually is going to be a general trait. If you set up differential operators in the right way, in a way that I'm going to introduce at the end of the course, then you should get things that compose to zero, that if you do a differential operator twice, if you sort of set up the right ones, you should get zero. Now that doesn't always happen. This one obviously is not always zero. But this, this is not just a coincidence. This is actually pointed at something deeper and more interesting that I'm going to return to later in the course. Although even earlier in the course, in the next couple weeks, this is going to be a very, very useful bit of calculation tool for us to know that these two operations compose to zero.